Hi, I'm Michael, and welcome to Beyond the Screenplay. Today we are talking about Moonrise Kingdom, the 2012 film directed by Wes Anderson, written by Wes Anderson and Roman Coppola. I'm joined by the Lessons from the Screenplay team, Trisha Rand. Hello, everyone. Brian Bittner. Wes Anderson, and motionless hello. <laughs> <laughs> and Alex Cayetos. Hi. So this is kind of like a, another deep cut for the channel. Moonrise Kingdom was kind of one of the earliest videos and I, I've been thinking about it today because I went and you know, rewatched the movie and rewatched the video that I'd made back in 2016. And I have these kind of weird, fond-ish memories of these this first series of videos and all the things that I was experimenting with. And it was interesting like watching this video because this was very much when I was trying to see if I could make the videos in the style of the movie <laughs> that mm -hmm. was being talked mm -hmm. about. Right. So the whole video is kind of done in a Wes anderson style. Yeah, rewatching it, I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> 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 I was like above and beyond. Like you have the little cut out pieces of the script on like a cork board. It's like, what? <laughs> you did all this? <laughs> it was a lot of effort. <laughs> At various <laughs> points in my life, I've been a huge fan of Wes Anderson and we can talk about Wes Anderson and we will. Uh, but so it was kind of a fun excuse to just do the Wes Anderson thing. And yeah, I spent a lot of time in After Effects creating all those camera moves and how to add just a little bit of that wide angle distortion to make it feel mm -hmm. like a really wide angle Wes Anderson look and stuff. So that was fun. And also just the other fun, like happy memory I have is that I think this was the first video where someone left a comment saying that the video made them cry. Mm. And like, Aww. that was an amazing feeling because this movie makes me cry. And mm -hmm. I was kind of hoping to capture some of that emotion in, in the video. So anyway, that's my little trip down memory lane for the video. And listeners, if you haven't watched this video, like it is one of my favorite ones on the channel. And it mm -hmm. like I was a friend of Michael's at the time and I was like watching the channel, but like casually. And then I saw this one when you made it and I was so impressed. It just, it is really cool. You know, incorporates all the different like font things and framing <laughs> things. It's just, it's a, it's a fun interpretation where, you know, we like to get clever with that stuff now, but it, it, it works really well in this particular case because the video is about the style of this movie and how the style like accentuates the theme and like comes together with the material really well. Yeah. Thank you. That's nice to hear. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and because, you know, it's Wes Anderson. So there is this huge, like, bag of style things you can draw from. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I feel like that's maybe a, an interesting starting point is to hear from you guys about going into this movie uh, whenever you saw it, if it was in theaters or more recently. I'm curious to hear people's thoughts and, like, expectations, because I feel like your relationship to Wes Anderson affects your experience of every Wes uh -huh. Anderson movie. There's always that kind of meta layer thing happening. Um, so I already kind of know what Alex is going to say. Brian, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I, I definitely enjoy this movie. I think it's something we've talked about a couple of times uh, very recently with Dark Knight Rises, which was there's a moment, I think, in any stylized filmmaker's career, stylistic filmmaker's career, where they sort of have like hit their sweet spot. And then there's a moment where their style can like kind of get in their way. Uh, at least for me personally. So it's like you have Reservoir Dogs, which is like shows promise. And then you have Pulp Fiction, which is like, look, look what like when it's perfect. And you have Kill Bill, <laughs> which is like, look what happens when he goes crazy. Yeah. And then you have like Memento to Dark Knight to Interstellar or like early Tim Burton stuff to Batman Returns to like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Alice in Wonderland and Dark Shadows, <laughs> where it's like, it's just like full on full tilt, you know? And I think Wes Anderson's been, that's kind of my issue with Wes Anderson sort of latter day Wes Anderson is like, I love early stuff like Bottle Rocket and Rushmore. And then you get like Royal Tenenbaums, which I think is, is one of his like, sort of, this is like the, the style matches the substance and everything sort of seems to be like working perfectly. And then like, I liked Life Aquatic, but it started to feel like, wait, this is just kind of like Tenenbaums at sea. It's like, look, we're doing more of this, but now it's bigger and there's, and there's like more cartooniness. And then you get to like Grand Budapest and the trailer for, um, it's called the French <laughs> Dispatch, which just looks like, you know, it's like so aggressive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, you're slapping me in the face with your style. Like, right. <laughs> And uh, and I think that my like probably my favorite Wes Anderson movie 
in the in the recent batch is actually Darjeeling Limited because it is more mm. calm and a little bit more character based and stuff. All that being said, Moonrise Kingdom, I think, is it sits in a weird place for me where it's like I do really appreciate it and I, I find it very enjoyable to watch. We can get into this later, but I also feel like there are thing there are moments where I think the style is getting in the way of the storytelling in a way that I find I personally find distracting. And there are other times where the style is is beautiful, you know, like where I feel like the style makes the storytelling better. So we can talk about that stuff later. But that's sort of my experience with the Wes Anderson movie this these days is I'm just like, I really appreciate this. And this is a lot of fun. But also, I might like this more if you weren't being so Wes Anderson right now. And Moonrise <laughs> sort of sits somewhere on the like, perfect, but like maybe too much kind of spectrum for me. Yeah, yeah. I feel like finding out where people's like, when it's too much Wes Anderson, right. it's always an interesting test. The threshold. Yeah. Mm, yeah. <laughs> the Anderson threshold. Yeah. I mean, I remember seeing this in theaters and I would consider myself to be a Wes Anderson fan just in the fact that like I, I really respect him as a filmmaker. And I also think he's like a cool writer who writes really interesting characters and things and really knows how to put together a movie, if I can phrase it that way, right? Like these these movies feel meticulously constructed. There isn't any sort of, and this is on purpose, any sort of like naturalistic flow to them at all. Mm -hmm. Like they, <laughs> <laughs> they don't they don't feel organic. They don't feel like free or easy to watch or anything like that. But they are, you know, immaculately put together just for me personally, often um, a distance that's created because the story usually isn't something that I like means a lot to me necessarily. But with Moonrise Kingdom, this actually like hits me in my heart mm. in a way that I think a lot of his movies don't manage to. Um, even if I I'm not sure if it's like his best one, whatever that means. I think it might be my favorite one just because I really have a passion for stories about young people in this way. And I do feel that it's exactly what you describe in the video about it, Michael, which is that it's all supporting the actual themes and content and like the the richness of the style is doing something very deliberate with the characters and interacting with all of the all of the content and um it's just so beautiful and cool and, and and just dreamlike and i don't know i really really like this movie i've seen it now like a number of times and you know i really love grand budapest hotel and i we talked about it on our top 10 of the decade and i disagree with you guys that it's too much i think it's a really <laughs> good amount um but uh i think moonrise kingdom is more personal for me so i just mm -hmm. really really love it yeah that's kind of the other interesting thing about the Anderson threshold is that like there's it feels like there's not really consensus either. Sure. Like you and I can be completely aligned on Moonrise Kingdom and then like Grand Budapest is the most unbearable of his films to me. <laughs> and so it's like it's just it's, right. it's a fascinating thing. Well, I think what happens is like and yeah, we'll get to when you hear Alex. Um, but when you do something that sets you apart, that thing that sets you apart is what gets you noticed and it is what people tell you they love yeah and then i think it's hard as a creator not to get this voice in your head that says well then that's what people want we need to do that mm -hmm. and there are going to be people who that's exactly what they want they want you to do that thing to 11 but then there are other people who want your movies to sort of still feel like a movie but with that thing that only you can bring to it and of course like you said michael that's going to be different for everybody obviously but i think that it's why maybe why it bothers me sometimes is because i feel like it's I feel like it's the filmmaker going, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. So now I have to do more of it. And it's like, no, no, we liked the thing. We liked the amount you did in your previous movie. So keep doing that amount. Yeah, it's it's an interesting balance to try to strike. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Alex, what, what are your thoughts on all of this? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely have a love-hate relationship with Wes Anderson. I I love this this movie. Like, I, I really love Moonrise Kingdom. Um, it's definitely my favorite of his films. Largely for the reasons you laid out, Trisha, where I it just mm -hmm. hits me in my heart. And I just, you know, it, it's funny. I go into kind of all Wes Anderson films with some resistance. And I think the resistance is they do put me at a distance. You know, that I, I, I get I get kind of just tired by the like we're coming out on this scene and somebody's basically posing and the way they're eating this sandwich is kind of like <laughs> cheating out to camera, like, cause they're like in a little like diorama right now. And it's like, <laughs> I don't know why, like, 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 like that's charming for a minute, but like in every movie for all things, it's just getting kind of annoying to me. 
and not really doing anything for me except for telling me i am wes anderson like hear me roar like mm. look at how everything's a goddamn dollhouse and you know whatever <laughs> um so it's like i like that if it's like if it like makes a difference to the story and is like, a, there's a reason to do it besides the fact that I am Wes Anderson. And so here we are in a dollhouse. Mm -hmm. I always begin this movie not liking it because the opening, the opening sequence, I do like the the music. I like how they use that record of like mm -hmm. the different parts of the orchestra. And it's kind of a way to introduce the family and the different nooks of this house. But it does just have that like, aggressive like the way Susie is reading her book is like she's not actually reading it she's like holding it up in an exactly like 90 degree angle unnaturally to like show the cover to the camera and everything is like posing for a camera and just kind of doing these like um I, I, don't, I don't know how you describe it but just basically like incredibly self-aware I'm not gonna let you lose yourself in any of this because this is like a bunch of staged little set pieces which I guess is intentional and is what people like about it. But I like I get very tired very quickly of that. However, there's a, always a point in this movie where it just melts me and I love it through and through. And I'm so happy and I want to cry by the end. This movie has something in it that pushes past my knee jerk resistance to whatever that thing is that I'm describing. The diorama dollhouse. We're all goddamn posing for the camera. <laughs> Wait, I just want to say one more thing about the Anderson threshold. Sure, sure. Which is that I don't have one and I don't think anybody should. Like, I'm sorry, because it has to do with expectations. And and my question is, what do you expect? Like what you what we want typically. And if you don't want this, then that's fine. But like people want from this what has to do with what Brian was saying. We want from a filmmaker the unfettered creation of that person's like unique brain and style and no so, we like, don't I, we, well i think <laughs> <laughs> well people who like a filmmaker essentially that's what they're signing up for this is just what i'm saying about expectations what you're signing up for when you go to a wes anderson movie is unfettered wes anderson and if you have a threshold about that maybe you don't want to go to a wes anderson movie uh, yeah I, d I disagree i think that i think it's <laughs> what we want you know, obviously you can go make a movie that's like the most vanilla movie ever, but also anybody can open their brain up and just pour a bunch of ideas onto a thing. We don't want just like, there's a character who shows up who never does anything again and has no, you know, I'm not saying this is Wes Anderson. I'm just saying like anybody could just make a movie that's like whatever zaniness they could think of in their brain. We don't want that. We want a, a balance between the two. We want something that feels like a solid movie that doesn't distract us. And we want the thing that only a certain artist can bring to their movie. And I, I will say that like something about the last like two thirds of this film, there is a synchronicity for me of style and content and character and emotion that sweeps me away. So, and he's mm -hmm. not being any less Wes Anderson-y, I think in the latter part of the parts of the movie, but it's no longer like physically removing me from like being engrossed in the story. Like I think, there's a lot of a lot of times the Wes Anderson films that I never really get into. I feel like he's holding me at that arm's length for like the majority of the film. It, it hasn't gotten my heart. It hasn't like pulled me in in a way beyond like looking at the window dressing. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's that's where Moonrise Kingdom works for me so well is that it it does grab my heart early, early on and, and doesn't let go of me. And so I, I'm, I'm down for all of the Wes Anderson -y stuff. Mm -hmm. And my comment wasn't about what Moonrise Kingdom being like way too far. It was that was just a more of a general like right. what I think what I think we want from these stylized film is what I want and what I think a lot of people want. Well, right. So I think that that's what's so interesting. And I think that this is this is the difference. I feel like we're we're showing the spectrum here where it's like mm -hmm. sometimes you're such a fan of that person that you do just want to see them go all out. Like I'm fine watching a David Fincher film be extremely David Fincher y, even if I know that's gonna turn off a bunch of people because like I just enjoy watching him do his thing. Mm -hmm. But if you're not all the way over there, if you're not in that camp and you want to go see a movie that is like directed by David Fincher. Like that's kind of a different thing than a like Fincher film. Right. And so it's an expectations thing, sort of like you were saying, Trisha. And that's the thing is like, and not to belabor this point, but I just, 
I think that we talk a lot about how, you know, too much creative like interference from outside forces can get in the way of like our greatest auteurs. Definitely. I'm not like the biggest Wes Anderson fan on the face of the earth or whatever, but I'm a little bit relieved that so far he's basically managed to make exactly what he wants. And maybe that's not everybody's cup of tea all the time, but I'm saying that I'm arguing for having that expectation when you walk into it, like you're going to get the most Wes Anderson thing that he decides to give you at this point. In a way, thank goodness that somebody is being allowed to operate like this. Do I wish that maybe Wes Anderson would reflect a little bit on his style? <laughs> sure. Do I wish that Tim Burton would also do that? Absolutely. I wish that. Like, take a step back, Tim, for a second and really think about this. But I'm saying it is nice when you go to a movie but like this by basically an auteur that has been given pretty much free reign and large budgets to make whatever they want, that should maybe just be your expectation of what you're going to get. And like some of them are going to really capture you and charm you. And maybe some of them are not. And maybe some of them you're really going to hate because you're not just not a Wes Anderson fan. And that's also okay. I just think that like there is something to be celebrated here in somebody who essentially, you know, gets to play as much as he wants to and and occasionally gives us Moonrise Kingdoms, which we all love. (laughs) No, definitely. I, I think quick example is there's a new Charlie Kaufman movie, which I know, Trisha, you've seen. Ah, uh, um, yes. Mm-hmm. That is an example. <laughs> right. And I personally loved it partially because there hasn't been a live action Charlie Kaufman movie in 12 years. So I was mm-hmm. just like so happy to have a Charlie Kaufman thing happening in my brain again. And Netflix pretty much gave him free reign to make exactly the movie he wanted to make. And again, I loved it. And I'm so happy that it exists. That said, I definitely don't think it's the best version of that movie. I think the best version of that movie is something that maybe a Spike Jones or, you know, like comes in and says, okay, cool. Now let's trim some of this and maybe let's, you know, let's reel it in a little bit. And I think that's all I'm saying is that I, I do love when artists are given free reign to do whatever they want. But I also think that like sort of perfect art tends to be just like 80 to 90 percent total unfettered free reign and then 10 to 20 percent of just the right people reining it in a little bit and and sort of making something that feels more perfect more complete more um focused i think yeah i mean i think it's that that kind of idea of like constraints are useful like Mm -hmm. that's where art happens and i think it is some of our you know the directors and and writers that have these crazy styles they exploded because their style was able to manifest itself even when put up against these constraints. Mm-hmm. And in that tension is sort of like where something special and new was created. I think there's a lot of conversation to be mm-hmm. had around all of this. That's interesting. And I do want to talk about Moonrise Kingdom, but I feel like the last kind of required topic of a Wes Anderson that I, I wanted to look into is is the idea of film as a language. Mm-hmm. And I feel like Wes Anderson's style is messing with that it's like he is kind of he's invented his own language or its own dialect or whatever you want to call it Mm -hmm. where you know i was listening to you talk alex and we've talked about Wes anderson before (laughs) but sort of like you know talking about how every shot is like staged and everyone's posing for a camera and like all these things but like in quote unquote normal movies that's also what's happening like everything is always posed for the camera well it's almost drawing your attention to the artifice right Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. I think that also reveals just sort of in some ways how perhaps arbitrary what we think of as normal cinema is. We're like, you know, we have an idea of what invisible filmmaking should look like, but that's probably just because we've been trained. Like that's a thing that's evolved over time. And and I think it kind of gets at a thing, you know, for me where, you know, you're saying it makes you really tired where every scene is like, Oh, they're posed and like, it's doing this thing. It's doing that thing. That is how I feel when I watch normal movies. Mm. Uh, and I feel <laughs> when like all sure. movies. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> pretty much. And like, especially when we were talking about her and I was talking about like, oh, yeah. oh, okay, here's the handheld shot where we do that. Like, that's how I feel where it's like, okay, here we go. You're going to do that thing now. Cause like, that's the thing you do. And we have to like, <laughs> wait for you to finish doing your thing until we get to the point of like what it was. Michael just knows movies too well. He can't enjoy them anymore. It's all over. 
<laughs> well, and, and so I think it's just, it's interesting because I find things like Wes Anderson and sort of, you know, I, I talk about Portlandia also and just kind of Fred mm-hmm. Armisen in, in general as a like things that don't, aren't trying to work on that surface level, aren't trying to create a like believable reality. Yeah. And sometimes, like, sometimes that's more relaxing for me and lets me then interface deeper with what they're actually then talking about or doing because I'm not distracted by them doing all the work to construct the invisible, the, th- the thing that lets you believe that this thing is happening, even though it's a construct and all that That is done. like the most Michael like, I know. problem <laughs> I've ever heard. That's amazing. <laughs> like, I appreciate when movies keep me at arm's length and I don't have to actually feel immersed in them at all. <laughs> and that's when I get immersed in them. That's that's what I it's, anyway. Yeah, so it's just too perfect. <laughs> there's all that, but yeah, I feel like Moonrise Kingdom. I think as we're kind of all saying, it it has that thing where Wes Anderson's style and the story and you know the themes that are being discussed kind of all click. The thing that resonates with me emotionally, also, I've realized it's kind of like Inside Out, like stories, like kind of coming of age stories mm-hmm. and like the loss of. Mm-hmm childhood and that innocence Mm -hmm. always resonate with me and i think this film is really interesting and how it you know it's about these kids that are kind of trying to be adults and trying to do what they think you know an adult person should do or should be and meanwhile you have all these adults that feel like lost and Mm -hmm. are super unhappy But like, you know, they have to be the ones that are protecting the kids. But like, do they know what's going on? And I think it's just it, it's such a cool juxtaposition of this this idea. And I feel like the style really amplifies it and creates this kind of magical world where it's, you know, a, like a child's imagined version of what reality like should be or could be. And then you also get to see the kind of depressing reality that is. And yeah. I just, it all comes together very nicely, I think, in this movie. Well, I think part of it is because it's set in the past, like it's set in the 60s. And I think that that also helps to create that storybook, like nostalgic kind of feeling to it. And And of course, it's also it looks very I don't know if gauzy is the right word, but, you know, it's 16 millimeter. (laughs) They shot it on 16, Mm. which is like my brain breaks every time I remember that. I'm just like, well, yeah, of course they did, because it, you know, it looks you can see that that film. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Quality to it. And of course, it's so gold and green, like everything in it is gold and green (laughs) and it looks like a vintage photograph. Right. Mm hmm. And it has this, of course, whimsical soundtrack, which is really beautiful and everything. Um, But I do think the choice to set it in the past, which a lot of his movies are not, since they don't exist in like a time or place exactly, (laughs) (laughs) they don't exist in reality. So you could kind of argue this about virtually anything that he's made. But I do think it works really well. And like, you know, all of the other like story elements that create that nostalgia, summer camp, right, is like very like, you know, and then this tape recorder that they have and they're writing notes to each other. So like even, you know, those of us that grew up in the 80s and 90s where we didn't necessarily have like the record player where she steals her little brother's record player and listens to like a 45. It was still the way that we experienced communication and media and like summertime even, right? Because this is a summer movie and summer in literature and like, narrative history and language represents like youth and childhood and then when summer draws to a close we have like metaphorically speaking the end of youth and childhood and the name of her house is summer's end and like Mm. it's all in the Mm -hmm. golden green summer like we get it but it it all (laughs) does come together around the exact thing that you're talking about about this like move toward maturity i I also think that the times when the movie looks the most like vintagey is when they are on the beach and they're mm-hmm. like dancing and it's sort of doing and it gives you this like Hal Ashby Harold and Maude kind of feel yeah. to it where it just sort of feels like you know talking about someone like Tarantino it's like I want to make my movies look like the 70s it's like why I don't know I just am and it's like okay but but I think with Moonrise Kingdom <laughs> it's like even if you didn't grow up in that time you do recognize that as an old thing. So it's like I, if you've seen a movie from the 60s or 70s, uh, especially those sort of like 
more like hippy dippy movies, you know, not, not like a Hitchcock movie. And I think that's like because you recognize that as an old thing, then you sort of feel nostalgia for these children. It's like you're remembering right. your own childhood, but you're also remembering a past time of, mm-hmm. you know, past era, basically. And I think that's one of those moments where I feel like the style and the substance uh, work really well together. Right. I think another part of the nostalgia for me in the film is the kind of genuine sweetness at the core Mm -hmm. of so many of the characters, including the adults, like the Bruce Willis uh, cop character. (laughs) He's so adorable. Just like such like a dopey, (laughs) sweet guy. The Edward Norton camp, what what they called a khaki scout leader. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. There's something that's just very innocent about the people in this story. Even the characters that are kind of like villains for a minute, like ultimately are revealed to kind of have, they're generally a good person beneath their flaws and i think there's something really lovely about that like you don't see many modern films with an entire cast of characters that at their core are just like good people Mm -hmm. who are making mistakes and ultimately just kind of like want the best (laughs) right I, i i really that's part of what wins me over with this film is i'm just so charmed by a world in which uh, people aren't super cynical, you know. They're not. They're not yeah. in this like modern cynical mindset. You know, there's just a genuineness to the people on this little island in their little community, and I, I just really, I love that in a Wes Anderson movie because I think that's part of maybe other Wes Anderson films that have maybe put me more at arm's length. Maybe don't have that warmth at the core of uh, at the core of the characters, and and this one absolutely does. Mm-hmm. Like, once again, even the characters that are cast as kind of villains, like the Tilda Swinton character, even by the end, social she's services. Kind of, yeah, social <laughs> services. <laughs> yeah. Like, she's kind of on board with the adoption by the end and is like kind of like, you know, going through with it and cooperating. And it just seems like everybody's like trying to do the right thing by the end of the movie. Yeah, I, I just love that about it. And I think it, it contributes to the nostalgia feeling. Real quick, I just want to mention that I love that Tilda Swinton is here because Wes Anderson is what Tilda Swinton would look like if she were male. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or like what 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 Beck would look like if he were human, you know. He just sort of like <laughs> there's always like the Wes Anderson like sort of uh, carbon copy characters. It's all it's usually like a Wilson mm-hmm. brother or something in like corduroy pants. <laughs> right, right. One thing that really contributes to the feeling um, that you're describing there, Alex, is something Michael pointed out in the video, which is the lack of artifice. Right, characters aren't performing they're not trying to look cool or like put up a facade really there's not a lot there's no deceit going on like you know that when the characters sneak away they're not like lying to do so they just they happen to like you know escape but there isn't that sense of people are trying to act tougher or cooler or whatever than they are and everyone's emotions are just right there on the surface so like the moment that I always think about with with Edward Norton's character, Scoutmaster Ward, is like the very first scene where he's like, Jiminy Christmas, he flew the coop. <laughs> and it's genuine, just complete surprise. Like in any other movie, that character would need to like downplay his surprise or be tough about that fact or something. And even when he's talking into his recorder by himself at night and he's like, kind of praying he's like please right. let us let us find him let him not have fallen <laughs> off a cliff or something like <laughs> but there's this sincerity to it even though you know the performances are stilted the characters are written without artifice yes and i think it creates that sweetness that you're talking about and one of the moments that always gets me is the one where it's near the end and, and i think it's maybe the one character that isn't really offered redemption by this movie and it's the lucas hedges character god bless him after seeing him in so many like recent things seeing him as a kid is so fun yeah uh redford is the name of the character but that moment where um sam confronts him later at the other boy scout camp and is like why don't you like me and just the the bare like honesty of that moment where have any of us ever thought about asking our bullies Why don't you like me? (laughs) Right. What did I do? It's a really interesting moment where you have no idea what Redford is going to say. Like, what could Redford say in that moment? And of course, what he says is, why should I? Nobody else does, which Which is is the um, most painful thing. Yeah. Awful. But it is. Yeah. it, It creates that sense of people could really say what they mean. And they do really say what they mean in this world. And that's 
beautiful and it doesn't happen in real life. And that's why I'm glad that this movie doesn't try to act like it's real life. Right. Yeah. That's why it really works for me in a way, because it's like I get to have this experience because it's not trying to be right. real life. And and so much of what's charming about Sam and Susie's relationship yes. is that just blunt honesty between the two of them, which is so sweet and so like unguarded and re- mm-hmm. refresh- refreshing to watch mm-hmm. a love story like that. Yeah. And I think what also works to make it, you know, not just, you know, it's not like this movie is just bubble gum and roses and everyone's just sure. sweet and happy all right. the time. Yeah. Like, it's not at all. They're honest and it hurts people's feelings. Like Susie and Sam, like, are kind of mean to each other on accident. Like they don't like people are fumbling, mm-hmm. like they're trying to do their best. But they the things that they mess up do have these emotional consequences or like. You know, the dog dies, which I point out in the video, which I still love. It's great. Like, I feel yeah. like this is my favorite example of like, kill the dog, <laughs> which then lets the audience know that like people can die in this universe. Mm. Like, this is a universe where somehow there's a tree house that's like 100 feet tall, but also <laughs> where a dog can die. And and I think that's an important spectrum to have in your head as, as you're experiencing a story like this. Definitely. I, I did actually feel differently because... First of all, the dog dies and it's it's dealt with at, in that arm's length Wes Anderson way where it's like, oh, the dog died. Well, that's unfortunate. He shouldn't have. Let's go, you know. And then you have this treehouse where it's like gravity doesn't matter. Like they can just live up there. And then what's the end of the movie is them on a very tall structure. And and like I didn't there was no part of me that was like these these characters might die, like somebody might die. Like I didn't really feel that. Or if they do, it'll be like somebody who you're not supposed to care about or whatever. Like there was something about it that I just, Hmm. because it was doing so much of the arm's length thing, I didn't have that emotional investment. I think it's also, again, it's it's the sort of the Wes Anderson thing where Moulin Rouge, all right, the end of Moulin Rouge, (laughs) spoiler. What? All right. (laughs) I know. We're with you. Continue. The most tragic moment in the movie, these characters we've fell in love with and watched fall in love for, you know, an hour and a half. She dies and it's awful and it's tragic. And then a gun flies out the window and boops the Eiffel Tower. (laughs) Yeah. While like the moon is watching in the background or whatever. And And it's just to me, it's like, it just feels like the biggest emotional F that's you. Not, wait, hold on. That's not after she it's dies. It's not after. It's before. Well, sure, sure. But but I'm saying like it's in it's during the, the most like dramatic moment of the movie. That's what I'm saying is like, I feel like, well, now that, I'm like that moment in the flow of that scene totally works for me. <laughs> I, I agree. Just have, I just have to chime in and say, right. we're going to talk about Moulin Rouge. Right. I'm like less now emotionally affected by the ending of the movie because now I'm like, but this is a universe where like guns go boop on the the Eiffel Tower. Meanwhile, Moonrise Kingdom, it's like, oh, this moment where they're on the edge of the thing and like da da da. And then what happens? Like they lightning kiss and then they're hanging off the side on a rope, all holding hands. And again, it's like the Wes Anderson-iness works for me in other points of the movie, but again, but when it is supposed to be like, here's the emotional climax to the movie. I'm like, but then why is it also like one of the silliest things you've done so far? And I think that like, that's where for like people who just want more of the Wes Anderson, as we were talking about, that's maybe like the perfect sequence for them. And for me, I'm like, I like when they're exchanging letters and every time you see a different thing, there's like different stuff going on in the background. I'm like, that's great because you don't need to be like emotionally invested in this letter exchange. It's just here are these characters, here's their lives. But when it is, this big emotional moment, I'm just like, am, I, like, am I supposed to be laughing or am I supposed to be like, am I supposed to feel warm feelings now? I don't really know what to feel because I feel like you just tried to do emotional things, but also did like the most cartoony thing in your movie at the same time. Hashtag Moulin Rouge. Wow. I think that is a completely valid w- way to feel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you are allowed to feel your feelings. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, yeah, it's interesting that that finale for me I think because, yeah, what is emotional about it for me is resolved like before they're all hanging off the building, like mm-hmm. like the 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 adoption going through, like that's what gets me about that scene. And sure, I don't really think they're gonna kill those kids. Um, yeah. So so I do I I do feel like I mean I I think the danger, I do think the danger is real in that scene. I I didn't put the put it together that because the treehouse existed, this means they can't fall and hurt themselves. Well, and to be fair with the treehouse, he, he says, says that's a guaranteed death from that height. And right. then they continue to use it and it's fine. No. Well, nobody nobody fell. 
nobody well, fell. Right. It's it's risky. Yeah, well, right. Nobody fell. Right. They continued to be at this extreme height and it was there was no Well, you can be in a tall thing and not fall, and then sometimes you fall. Like the door like, falls yeah. off the treehouse when the khaki scouts are in it, and, it, and there's nobody like a cares. five second no. There's like a yeah. five second silence while they wait for it to hit the ground so we can sense how tall the treehouse is. And then they turn around and keep talking, and the guy doesn't move away from the door. He just keeps no. Well, the, the, well, the, the kids kid are being is, has a face of yeah. like, well, uh oh, that was a close one. <laughs> I think that's what. Basically, I know what you're saying, Brian, but. Yeah, that, the final sequence works for me because I don't think the main point of that scene is like the danger part. It's about the, you know, convincing this kid that he's got a future to live for and, uh, you know, a parent sure. finally. And so and that, that's once that's resolved, I'm kind of OK with like whatever the goofy, you know, the like miniatures of them hanging off of a church, <laughs> <laughs> whatever that is. And also this to me reads as an elaborate parable essentially because which i think it's supposed to given that it's juxtaposed against a classic bible story which is a, like a myth Blood. right a parable yes exactly mm -hmm. and so you know and it, it, it's like referencing other you know stories of like young love that we've seen before it's very romeo and juliet in that way of like they're willing to give up everything to be together I um, mean, I think the willingness to die is like sort of where it gets dark and real, right? Where they're like, we we might jump, we we're gonna try to swim for it, but the fall is gonna kill us, maybe. And we're we're willing to do that because we feel so ostracized and isolated from this community. Because that's the thing for me, I guess, when I watch this, is that yes, it's a beautiful coming of age story, and it's a story about young love, but ultimately, to me, it's a story about lonely people who find a community. Definitely. Right. Mm. Like it's all of these people who are spread out on this island who are isolated. There aren't roads that connect them. There are very few like phones that connect them. There's a community, but it's all of these isolated individuals. And as it turns out, the most isolated young man among all of them is the one that ultimately actually brings the community together and like finds helps everybody kind of find each other he helps Susie kind of connect with her family he helps the um what is Bruce Willis is Captain Sharp he helps Captain <laughs> Sharp like <laughs> you know he's this lonely old bachelor he helps Scoutmaster Randy Ward like find love actually and so for me you know it is a, a story about Sam and Susie but it really is about that sheltering idea of when they come together at the church they're like coming together as a community and being drawn, drawing um, Sam back into that community is ultimately what saves all of them. And so I think that sense of Sam and Susie feel so alone that they're willing to die um, still is resonant because that feeling is real regardless of anything else. Yeah. And and I think that's why I, I kind of compared to Inside Out in my head where it's like this it's a story of like finding a place where you belong, yeah. which is kind of cool, or creating a place where you belong. Mm. And like, it's okay to be sad. It's okay to be you is I think a really powerful message. And I think this, this film does capture that in a really like beautiful way. I mean, when it gets to the end of the movie and that musical cue with like the, I don't know, the child choir, whatever that sound mm -hmm. is. Yeah. When that's like playing and just those last images of Susie and Sam and he's getting into the cop car with his little cop outfit, like <laughs> I definitely <laughs> always cry. Like it, it's like guaranteed I'm going to be tearing up at that part of the movie. And I just uh, any movie that can like guarantee do that to me, I'm very impressed by mm. uh, like no matter how many times I watch it, it has touched me that way. And so, yeah, for all my like Wes Anderson, like allergies, uh, I'm so impressed with his ability with this film to like cut through all of that and just mm -hmm. like grab me. We've talked about this before too, but that it's, it's a bittersweet thing because there is something that is like lost and sacrificed along the way. And I think that always makes it feel uh, earned and that much powerful. You have yep. like this, this inlet that they had this like one beautiful day where they could be exactly who they wanted to be. Like that gets washed away. Like that doesn't exist anymore. Like, mm -hmm childhood is gone but on the other side of it there is good also and i feel like that's i always appreciate that in movies when you know whether it's killing the dog or whatever it is like showing that in order to grow actual sacrifices have to be made i feel like that's when it feels when the emotions feel real to me well and like the adult 
storylines aren't like, yeah. wrapped, up, wrapped up nicely. Like, mm-hmm. you know, the Francis McDormand, Bill Murray marriage, like, stays together kind of for the kids. But, you know, like, sh- she seems like she'd be happier with the Bruce Willis character. Bruce Willis obviously wants to be the Francis McDormand. I don't know any of their names off the top of my head. <laughs> you know, but basically, yeah, it's like, you know, the... The story doesn't like have that um, generic Hollywood ending where it's like right. all the people who are supposed to be together ended up together. Mm-hmm. It's more of like life goes on, time passes, you know, but but good things can happen. And, and but it doesn't have that feeling of like when I said there's a sweetness to this movie, it definitely is. Um, the sweetness is in the fact that the characters are they're not malevolent. Like there's not there's no malevolent character except for maybe that one kid the um <laughs> Red the kid. yeah but but yeah there's, there's not there's no kind of malevolence in the characters there's just making mistakes fumbling like you said michael um but all just kind of doing the best they can and that that's where the sweetness comes from not from everybody being happy or perfect or you know things yeah yeah. yeah yeah one of the things i love is the the sort of the like childhood feeling of adventure, you know, that you get Definitely. like, I mean, I mean, you know, any Wes Anderson movie has the like, Oh, let's have our checklist of like strange items that we brought or whatever. But <laughs> when it is a khaki scout and it's some kids going away, like that feels really resonant to me. Cause I remember mm-hmm. being that kid, you know, being like, it, like, it all makes sense. It's like the Wes Anderson things are being plugged into like the right thing you know <laughs> right yeah yeah exactly and, and you know i think i remember like watching batman and being like i need a utility belt and like asking my mom to like help me make a utility belt and deciding uh-huh. what would go inside it for when i go on my adventure whatever that kind of thing you know and then yeah there is the sort of the like the kid confidence like you were saying michael like kids trying to sort of act like adults and you know you get the most of it when he's when sam just like saunters into the um to the rehearse to the like play and yep. he's checks the right. water fountain you know <laughs> and then, yeah, 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 and yeah, then yeah. he just comes out and says what kind of bird are you no what kind of bird are you just like <laughs> the weirdest like kid confidence mm-hmm. ever i think one one thing i love about wes anderson is when he does give you glimpses of what's going on under this veneer uh, is that like uh, the characters are sort of acting in this very stilted way and the movie is sort of acting in this stilted way, but then there's something else going on underneath. And obviously with with him, you have the sort of like, oh, he's a troubled child and da da da. Mm-hmm. And then with her, you have the scissors moment where she just says like, oh, sometimes I, I forget exactly what she said. Sometimes I go I, berserk. I go berserk sometimes and that kind of thing. And it's it's very subtle in the sense that it's not about like, hey, are you a troubled kid? Yeah, so am I. All right, let's talk about it. You know, it's just these sort of you see why these characters are drawn to each other mm-hmm. and also why they sort of need to get away from from their lives, you know? Yeah, it's really interesting. I checked it this time around. We don't actually meet Sam until like 17 minutes into this movie. It's like a mystery. It's like the kids mm-hmm. di- disappear. You don't know why. And then suddenly they come together. Yeah. It is a really cool construction and introduction of the person who turns out to be the main character. I think mm-hmm. it's, you know, you know, it wouldn't be more much more than an intellectual exercise to discuss whether like which one of them is a the protagonist. Is it him or is it Susie? Mm. I don't I don't know if that's useful, but there is no doubt that Sam is the one Sam's escape and um, is what ends up driving this plot, really. And it creates all of this. I was going to say conflict around him before we even meet him, where the khaki scouts going like he's dangerous like i i don't want to be the one caught <laughs> caught without a weapon we're like is he like well, who is he and and also we... why do you people have weapons your children that's part of the like the kind of like 60s thing is like these sure. kids are doing like super dangerous things they have yeah. all these weapons like this shouldn't be allowed but it's total a, lack of supervision it's pre-helicopter parenting it's just like kids are running wild with like dangerous objects <laughs> <laughs> right. But yeah, yeah, that whole um can you if your movie is about every single one of these people and how they like end up coming together and intersecting by the end of the movie. It's a really confident and interesting move to not introduce your main character for 17 minutes into the movie. I really think it works here, though. And then, of course, you have that great sound cue where we find the great needle drop with that uh, Hank Williams song when we first meet him, mm-hmm. um, where he's paddling his canoe. It's really great. Mm-hmm. Wes Anderson has a lot of like effective flashbacks, and I feel like this this film is kind of like filled with them. Maybe Definitely, not filled, but there is that like you know the jump back 
you know, we, you, we see Sam and Susie finally meet in the field. Mm-hmm. We just see them looking at each other. And then it's like one year earlier and we get that sequence where they meet and we kind of like get it. And then later we get the the flashback of them writing letters to each other. And I feel like it's one of the most effective sequences yes. where they're writing letters and it keeps getting cut off. So you're having to kind of piece together the things that they didn't quite get to say, but you have the visuals of each place mm-hmm. that they're in and what their lives are. And just in a very efficient little period, so much plot information and like emotional information is like downloaded into your head. I feel like that's the other thing about the Wes Anderson style and why I think studying this movie makes sense to me anyway, is that, you know, talking about film language again and how, you know, the performances are all like very stilted and like dry, but still somehow there's like deep emotion conveyed. Absolutely. And I think that's what's so interesting is that it's like, it's not relying on, you know, a handheld shaky cam and some actor's face (laughs) bawling and like reaching for the Oscar to like convey the emotion. Mm -hmm. It's somehow creating that through these all these other tools. And there is like great performances happening, like within the, you know, the framework of a Wes Anderson film. I feel like you can get it and be on and or or not. And I think there there are really fun performances in here. But it is just interesting to kind of watch it and just see what are all the other filmmaking tools being used to convey that. And a, a tiny example of that that maybe isn't the most effective. But when when we're first meeting Edward Norton, you know, we have him going through the camp and he's talking to all this, the khaki scouts and stuff. Mm-hmm. Once they're all marching out to go search for him, the one kid kind of in like a weird Saving Private Ryan <laughs> scene is like, what were you before you were yeah. like a khaki scout? Like, what's your real job? And he's like, I was a teacher. Why are you asking me this? And then he walks out of frame and comes back. I'm going to change my answer. I'm a khaki scout first and then I'm a teacher. And so it's like the performance isn't doing all the work. It's the like it's that moment where you kind of see him changing how he wants to present himself. Mm-hmm. That's conveying, you know, this is what he's caring. This is what he cares about. This is kind of what he's struggling with. Is like, is he this this khaki scout leader that he wants to be or not? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's paid off when he jumps away from the explosion. At the end. I- <laughs> that part is like so ridiculous with like the kind of cheap, like yeah. just like after effects fire. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> And that's the kind of moment where like the Wes Anderson right. goofiness works for me because I'm like, this is supposed to be a goofy moment. Like I am supposed to be having fun watching surprise Harvey Keitel get carried away. By yeah. Edward Norton. <laughs> I mean, I love the in that same scene, Michael, the um, tableau of the like Last Supper style of table where mm. they're like mm. Edward mm-hmm. Norton is seated right in the middle and the khaki scouts are all there. And then there's an empty chair. Right. And the same thing where right. like they discover the hole in the tent. It's. Again, to me, it's like a thematic reminder of like there's a Sam shaped hole in this story, in this community Mm -hmm. that, you know, we don't like we don't even understand what is missing in this community yet. And then we eventually like come to see that. But yeah, it's just it's exactly what you're saying. The filmmaking is doing the the narrative and the character work for you, even when Sam is not on screen. We're getting the character work from it, from everybody else and from what that camera is doing. To answer your question, not that you were even asking it earlier about who's the protagonist, I think now that I've thought about it, I really think it is Sam because there's a dramatic question raised about him mm-hmm. when his foster parents don't invite him back. It's basically what's going to happen to him? Where is he going to go? And it's answered in that climax with right. Bruce Willis agreeing to adopt him. So I feel mm-hmm. like that tells me pretty clearly that that's actually what the ultimately what the story is about, the dramatic question is about is, is like, what's going to happen to this kid? Right. And in the second half, we have, you know, I love the moment where the, the scouts come to rescue him and he says, not without Susie. And then she pokes her head in and there mm-hmm. she is, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so it's so like, we lovely. Yeah. But we definitely spend more time with him at least post midpoint because it's more like he becomes sort of a little bit more of the central character in the second half of the movie. Yeah, definitely. Again, kind of the last thing about the Wes Anderson style that now, you know, it's been a while since I watched a lot of his movies because I was a little worn out. Um, But I do kind of want to go back and rewatch a lot of Mm. them. Is that this this dry arm's length style, I think when it works for me, it's kind of doing the two plus two thing that we talked about in No Country for Old Men, where, you know, give the audience two and give them two and then let them create four. Mm -hmm. And if like this kind of does that, for me emotionally where it's like it's not going to supply you with the emotion that you're supposed to feel right now it's going to give you the two parts that together synthesize the emotion and if it's if you're plugged in and synced into it i think it can bypass some of the 
defensive walls that can be built when you're used to, you know, emotion coming in in a certain way. And I think that's that's one of the things that I like about Wes Anderson as a filmmaker and the way he uses the film language and what I think is so effective in this one is that it's at any given moment, what's happening on screen isn't the point. It's how all the pieces that are being presented to you are being pieced together in your head that is what's so affecting. Mm -hmm. And I, I just think that's a really cool really cool thing to be able to do with film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think that for me, his style works best when he uses it to pull the rug out from under you. And maybe some of the examples I gave earlier, like the Moulin Rouge example, is like the opposite of this, where it's like an emotional moment is then sort of like interrupted by by a style thing. It's maybe it works best for me when it's the other way around, where it's like I'm in style land, but then suddenly I'm like, oh crap, this this just got real. And I think right. two examples that come to mind are in Royal Tenenbaums, when you're doing all these style things and everything, and then Richie goes to the mirror and he says, I'm going to kill myself in the morning. And then he just attempts it right away instead of waiting. And it's just like, oh, crap, like this movie just mm -hmm. got really real. Uh, and then also they kill the dog because mm -hmm. Wes Anderson hates dogs. <laughs> Despite the fact he has a movie called I Love Dogs. Um, and then <laughs> you're welcome. And then in uh, like Darjeeling Limited, the uh, the three characters sort of show up and they see some kids playing in the water. And I think Owen Wilson says, like, look at these assholes, <laughs> like, which is just like a hilarious line. And then yeah. suddenly the kids fall in the water and like one of them dies. And like one of them, one of the three brothers, like can't save one of these three children, you know, and it's like mine didn't make it. Uh, yeah, mine. Did, yeah, exactly. And it's like yeah. it's like those are the moments where I really feel like the style works because because suddenly you're not at arm's length anymore. Now, suddenly he is going. Like now we're in real territory and maybe Moonrise Kingdom doesn't do that enough for me. And that's why I fail to feel like emotionally connected with it as much as I'd like. But I, there are plenty of moments where Wes Anderson does that. And, and I think he does it really powerfully. I like just, I don't know, speaking of the adults, this is not super related to what you were talking about, but I was thinking about the different performances that I really love um, in this one. And obviously Bill Murray is incredible in this. <laughs> And always, and always, like, of course, he always, always is his just like powerlessness mm. throughout this movie where he just feels so like he's striking out at random and he has no control over anything. And you just sense that frustration where everyone else is kind of just like being as calm as they can under the circumstances. And Bill Murray's character is kind of like voicing this like very primal sort of frustration about how he doesn't understand his family. He doesn't understand his wife. He doesn't understand his daughter. He doesn't understand why anybody else is being calm and normal, right? <laughs> Under the circumstances. Um, and of course, the scene where he like lifts the tent off of them is just the best yeah. one. <laughs> it just runs. It's like a visual gag. Yeah, exactly. But the other character I really love, the other performance that I just really love in this is is Jason Schwartzman's. Hmm. Um, <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, it's always a surprise yeah. when he comes in. Yeah, Yeah, yeah Cousin Ben. Because... He is treating Sam and Susie with the utmost seriousness. Yes. Where nobody, no other adults in the movie really are, where they're like, you can't possibly know what you want, your children. And he's like, wait, you're going to get married? Okay, great. I can marry you. Basically, he's like, it definitely won't hold up in, in any sort of court, but I will marry you. <laughs> and it is a nice, refreshing change. It's completely unrealistic, but it does create that twist potentially in the third act where you really aren't can't predict what's going to happen next where when they leave on that boat he's like i'm gonna send you off to a crab boat and you're like maybe like <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah like it, it, it does it creates that well if potentially a character an, an adult character is willing to take them seriously because we've seen Susie's mother tell her that she doesn't know what she wants that she can't understand what she's doing everybody is telling them that they're kids and they don't know what they're doing and then you have one older adult character that absolutely treats them like they're adults. I think it ushers you into that third act that ultimately gives Sam and Susie more agency to, to act in the third act where they then like they get married and then they like steal the, I don't know, they go get struck by lightning and they like are running, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that whole thing where they are taking really decisive action to flee and escape in a way that they were not in the first half. In the first half, you get a sense they're playing. In the second half, mm -hmm. um, especially the scene where they decide to get married and they are treated 
very solemnly by Jason Schwartzman's character, you get that sense of passage into adulthood where like, yeah, maybe they are going to go be adults now or try to be. Right. Well, and, and I feel like that's why for me, the the, the third act does feel extremely dangerous. Like mm-hmm. it's this weird thing where it's like there's a, a they poured water through a model of a campsite and I can tell that it's that. But also I'm like really scared for what it's mm-hmm. what's going to happen and what it means. And yeah, I, I think there is kind of like a bestowing of some adulthood, like you were saying, that, that happens mm-hmm. that then I think makes for me anyway, it makes that that third act feel dangerous because now it feels like well they aren't really like kid kids anymore like i think they could die like i feel like that could be a thing that would happen in this movie Mm -hmm. um yeah for sure yeah so yeah well just two rules now for wes anderson movie the dog is gonna die and bill murray will definitely not be in a stable relationship It wouldn't be fun to watch him be in a stable room. Yeah, right. no one wants that. <laughs> I also just feel like Bill Murray is like Wes Anderson films incarnate. Right. Where like his performances are always like, like he knows he's doing a performance and he knows you know, but he's still doing it and you're still connect. Like there's so many levels that happen as soon as like I see Bill Murray's face that I just, I crack up immediately. <laughs> but I'm also like listening intently to what's happening. <laughs> Uh, Bill they call themselves counselor. They call each other counselor in this. I love it. Yeah, yeah the lawyers. Yeah. yeah, they're good. Yeah, Bill Murray and Wes Anderson are match made in heaven. Yeah. So I really love getting to interact with our listeners online and especially on Twitter because you guys have given me a lot of inspiration about what films or shows I should be checking out, including Dark, which became one of my favorite shows of all time because of repeated recommendations from listeners. So thank you. It's also a place I enjoy sharing what I'm watching or thinking about, like my sudden desire to podcast about the Robert Zemeckis 2000 film, What Lies Beneath, a tweet, (laughs) a classic, which got several (laughs) likes, I might add. So there are... Five to seven people who agree with me. <laughs> oh, so, <laughs> well, in that case. So if you want to be in on this riveting conversation, uh, follow all of us and be on the screenplay on Twitter and let us know what we should be checking out and covering on the podcast. You can find all our Twitter handles in the show notes. And let's get back to the show. Awesome. Well, why don't we go around and say what lessons we're going to take from Moonrise Kingdom? Trisha, do you want to start? Sure. My lesson actually has to do with Bob Balaban. He's so... Little. <laughs> Haven't gotten to talk about yet. <laughs> yes. As all lessons should. <laughs> well, I feel like he also adds that like extra yep. like stress in the third act. Totally. And and that mm-hmm. is part of what I was going to say where that the scene on the beach where he's like the barometer is at like 18 inches and dropping. The wind is coming in hard like and you can see the bright light on his face where he's like interacting with the camera and determined right. against, you know, the. Well, it's first of all just gorgeous because it's dawn, right, on the sea and the canoes row up and everything. But he's determined to deliver this piece of information to you in spite of the coming storm. But that is what my lesson has to do with, which is I think that the narrative framework of this, which is introduced at the very beginning, like Bob Balaban comes in and he starts telling us about here's the island and here's the world. And it's most famous for this storm, which is going to strike in three days time, is really good, I don't know, structural work that goes right at the beginning. If you didn't have that character, you would wonder where this is going. But when we know that the storm is coming in three days time, which again, it's very parable-ish, like it's three days time, it's, we get it. It's like any classic or myth or story or whatever, but it creates this backbone of a ticking clock, a timeline. It's just really basic narrative device. Like tell us that something extreme or bad or whatever is going to come to a head in the third act of this movie. Tell it to us outright. We don't know how it's going to interact with the characters because we haven't met any of them yet, but it, it just is effective at piquing the audience's interest and keeping us interested. And And Bob Balaban continues to pop up throughout the movie to remind us that something is going on. The the wildest moment is when he's on the dock and he's actually being a character in the movie. It's a fun surprise. (laughs) It is. You're like, oh, you actually were, you're in the story as well. But yeah, it's, I have no idea how I would possibly incorporate that into my own writing. Because the clunky version of it is like a weather report that says, you know, they hear it on the radio and... They say that it's going to be the worst storm in a century. But again, Wes Anderson is drawing attention 
to the artifice and the narrative aspect of this. And I think that that makes the Bob Balaban framework of this really, really effective. And I I think I'll just kind of piggyback off of that because I feel like continuing on what I've been talking about with film as language, Mm -hmm. I feel like exactly what you're you're saying where, you know, how would you use this in a quote unquote normal movie? Well, you'd have to come up with like, Mm -hmm. it's a weather report on TV and it's like, see, we're doing the thing, but it's believable in this world. Right. And I feel like no one wants that. (laughs) I'm just so exhausted by that. I don't know. Yeah. Like I, I appreciate that language evolves over time and things become familiar and then someone does something new and then people experiment with that and and it changes. And I, I love that Wes Anderson, you know, has experimented with film language and arrived at something that clearly works for people. And so I feel like whether or not it works for you, I think it's worth studying if if you want to be a filmmaker. Like, what is he doing? Like, what are mm-hmm. he's using all the same tools that, you know, anybody else would like, you know, a David Fincher or a Steven Spielberg. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like, it's all the same tools, but he's using them in a completely not completely, but in a, in a different way that can still tell a story and evoke emotion and do it in ways that are maybe more powerful in some ways. Like maybe it's okay to just break the fourth wall at the beginning of your movie and say something bad's going to happen soon. Like right. when did that become not okay? And so I, I just appreciate things that mess with that language because it leaves room for things to change and evolve, which is always exciting to me. And I feel like this is a great example of a film that has its own language and yet tells a really compelling emotional story Mm -hmm. as great as any other film. And Susie's storybooks also give us that, like they lend to that attention on this is a book, right? Like we're hearing a story essentially being like read out loud or told out loud to us by somebody like Bob Balaban, or in this case, just by Wes Anderson. Mm -hmm. But again, it draws attention to the construction of like, you're hearing a little fairy tale kind of, which I really love. Which also wrote Tottenham's does with Alec Baldwin, like you're literally seeing a book, a chapter, and then you read the first things that Alec Baldwin is saying. It's like very clearly trying to be like, we want you to feel like you're in storybook world. Mm. Yeah, but it is interesting, like, if that wasn't there, like, would this movie not be as good? Like, it's just, it's interesting that, like, we need that, like, well, there's a justification for it to be different. But if we didn't have that justification, would it still be impactful? Question marks, film language, things to think about. Yeah, I I think, I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel terribly differently about the movie if it weren't, if it didn't have some of those, um, some of those things in it. I, I, I would just think, like, like, as Trish was saying earlier, like, you have certain expectations when you watch a Wes Anderson movie. So I would just be taking, I would just be consuming a Wes Anderson movie, whether there was a narrator, whether there was a sort of storybook, like hint given to me and that kind of thing. There's still a lot of perfectly centered frames and Mm needlepoint. So that's really all you need. Yeah. (laughs) Right. But yeah, I guess those things do make it accessible to people that maybe aren't already plugged into the Wes Anderson thing and why it can then be a a thing that more people can study, Mm -hmm. therefore. Right. And in the way that like, oh, brother, where art that was a lot of people's favorite Coen mm-hmm. Brothers movie. I do hear that this is like a lot of people's favorite Wes Anderson movie mm-hmm. because it's a little bit more accessible. Like it is holding your hand a little bit more or it's such a world unto itself that you don't need to have right. seen a bunch of Wes Anderson movies to enjoy this. Right. So I recently showed it to a bunch of teenagers last year when we could still like gather in places who had never seen <laughs> it and hardly had seen any Wes Anderson movies and they loved it. Mm-hmm. So. Hope for the future. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Brian? There's kind of a Butch and Sundance thing going on in this movie. Like you have okay. these two characters on the run. There's a character named Redford. Uh, and then, <laughs> and then of course, the big moment at the end, they say like, well, should we swim for it? Well, the mm-hmm. fall will probably kill us. Like it's that, that exact kind of thing. And I, I think that what's interesting about these two characters is like we were talking about earlier, the fact that they feel sort of like they're outcasts from their families and from society and all this kind of thing. So it gives the characters a reason to feel like they are the only solace for each other. Mm -hmm. It's not just like Romeo and Juliet, like we are in love, but there are also these antagonistic forces. It's, it's not that it's like the antagonistic forces are why we are not necessarily, it doesn't have to be in love, but why we found each other and why Mm -hmm. it's like collateral is the opposite of this, where I talked about two characters being in a room who have very different opinion, uh, very different outlooks 
and what kind of challenges that can bring. This is a movie where these two characters have this thing in common where they feel like there's some, there's something off about them and they keep being told that there's something Mm -hmm. off about them. Uh, And then they find each other and, and they're able to, to find solace in each other. And then that the first half of them, the first half of the movie is them running from everyone. And then the second half of the movie is now they have allies who are like on their side and trying to support them. But also now the antagonistic forces are growing greater and greater, you know, and there's something beautiful about that. Um, but yeah, it was just something that struck me this time was even though it is like, like I said, subtle, it's kind of under the surface that these characters are sort of not thought of as good kids or however you want to put it, like, like perfectly functioning kids, you know, like there, there is this issue to them, but the fact that they then find solace in each other, uh, because of that, I think is really cool. I love romances that feel like they're about something. Mm-hmm. Like there's a reason mm-hmm. why these people fall in love and we can yeah, see right. it very clearly. Yeah. Yeah. That it, That is a kind of a nice even juxtaposition with Romeo and Juliet where it is just sort of like we're young and so we're in love <laughs> for <Right>. reasons. <laughs> yeah. Whereas like the, there's there's gravity to this. Yeah. Awesome. Alex? Uh, we've already covered my lesson a lot, which is just what I've been talking about with the just how sweet and kind of innocent the mm-hmm. characters are and how the thing that makes me cry in movies is almost always guaranteed to be the bittersweet feeling, whatever that thing is. So whenever a director can put together a concoction that like gives me the bittersweet feels, that's going to like, that's what I want, you know? And, and I think this movie, because it puts genuinely like kind of innocent, naive, like g- screwed up but good-hearted characters into truly like heartbreaking situations Mm -hmm. you know like it's heartbreaking that sam has nobody who wants him like that's really intense actually he's an orphan who doesn't have anybody who wants to even like take him in um so so really deeply heartbreaking situations placed into a really like beautiful charming nostalgic world Mm -hmm. that combo just like does something. And so I think it just it's a good lesson of like you can have characters and a world that is kind of sweet and light and but then give it power by not not holding back with like how grave and sad mm-hmm. and and real the actual situation they're in can get, you know. So and that's that's what we're talking about with the you know, with the dead dog or whatever. It's like it's a world mm-hmm. in which that can happen and things mm-hmm. can be very serious as well. And that combo is where the power really comes from. Whereas yeah. like we've, as we talked about before, I think, you know, there's, there's films where it's just so depressing and the world is so just dark and gloomy and grave from minute one that I, I don't emotionally engage because I'm like, this whole movie is going to be just utterly miserable. So I'm not really getting invested here. But when there's, when there's this charm and this sweetness that I want to be like a part of, and then the movie like punches you in the gut with like a hard reality. That's when it gets me. Yeah. And so, yeah, kudos to Wes Anderson. He, he really he really got me with this one. <laughs> and the scene where Susie's parents are lying in separate beds, staring at the ceiling mm-hmm. and just they feel so disconnected from each other. I feel like really um, like paints that sort of opposite picture that you're talking about, Alex, where it's like, this is potentially Sam and Susie's future. Like they could just grow up into older people who don't talk to each other anymore and don't love each other anymore. And there's that counterpoint to love, right? Where we sense that love, they found love in this case and it's really sweet and beautiful. But we know as adults that that doesn't last forever. And the movie takes care to show us that there's a about impermanence to it potentially well i think it's part of actually what makes me want to cry at the end of the movie is because yeah you have this feeling of like this beautiful sweet thing is not going to last like yeah. this is this is a moment mm-hmm. in time and it's sweet but it's impermanent mm-hmm. what was i watching recently that somebody told oh i think it was mulan <laughs> where, <laughs> what? where someone said there's there's no bravery without fear mm. Mm. and i feel like that that as an idea is, is kind of like that where like you can only like sweetness and optimism is only as powerful as like the forces that it's trying to overcome mm. and this film has tons of forces that that innocence and sweetness is has to overcome in order to be present yeah all right what has everyone been watching speaking of mulan yeah what what movies what 
books but listening things have been <laughs> consumed by the humans here brian wow so i was invited uh to be a guest on the cinefleck podcast by ethan colburn the host nice he uh pairs a movie with a drink which is right up my alley and one thing i love to do is to infuse whiskey based on a theme so when the early seasons of Game of Thrones were on. I uh, made, I would like go to like watching parties and I would make a one called Debt Keeper, which is a bourbon infused with honey, vanilla, and brown sugar. And it was for the Lannisters. So it was sort of all very rich, blondy ingredients. And then for a house <laughs> Martell, I made one called Rose Thorn, uh, which was infused with rosemary and rose water. RIP Dame Diana Rigg. Yes. Yeah. Today. And yeah. And, um, and then I made like a, an infused rum for House Greyjoy, like things like that. And so I just totally love like nerding out on things like that. So he and I were talking and I said, well, let's do an infusion. I'll teach you how to how to make it. And he said, great. And then we settled on High and Low, the Kurosawa film from 1963, which is like a really cool kind of crime drama all about class struggle. It was one of the main influences for Parasite, which I mentioned on our Parasite podcast. And it's just, it's really good. It holds up so well. And I taught him for reasons that will become clear if you listen to the episode, I taught him how to infuse a Japanese whiskey with black pepper, white pepper, and grapefruit, which I'm drinking right now. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, so it is out now and the podcast is called Cinefleck, C-I-N-E-F-L-E-K. Nice. Awesome. Cool. We'll put a link in the description to that. Trisha, what have you been watching? So my good friend Danny O'Malley is a documentary producer, and he worked on the first season of Chef's Table on Netflix. But the new season of Chef's Table has just come out. It's called Chef's Table Barbecue. And my friend Danny is the co-executive producer on it. So his is like, I'm just so proud. His is like the second credit when you watch it. And I'm <laughs> nice. like, Danny, he did it. It's gorgeous. Like, I don't know, even if you don't care about food documentaries, this is one of the most beautifully shot and produced like docu-series I've ever seen. There's only four episodes. It's about four different barbecue chefs. And each episode is treated basically like a mini biography of this person. So it's about the cooking, um, but it's really more about each chef's like personal journey towards how they became like these successful barbecue chefs. But it's just so stunningly filmed mm. and put together. It's just so rich and colorful and beautiful and gorgeously envisioned. And and yeah, it's I was blown away by it. I know that Danny's good, but I was just very, very impressed by it. I was texting him about it. I was like, it looks so gorgeous. It's like the best food porn ever. And he was like, actually, on the show, we prefer to call it food romance. And I was oh. like... <laughs> When I when I first got a 4K TV, literally Chef's Table was the first thing I put on right? to like test it because it's just like it's so gorgeously shot and like oh you my know, gosh Dolby Vision HDR crazy, yeah, yeah. And they had to finish the whole thing in post in like uh, you know in COVID times and people working from home and it it just sounds like a Herculean effort on the part of the team. Um, anyway, obviously I'm very proud of it, but it's also just a wonderful like little four part docu series. Uh, Created by David Gelb. So yeah, definitely go check that out. It's on your Netflix. And since we're shouting out our friends, my good friend Jeremy Lusk was one of the editors on the new season of Chef's Table. So good for him. What? He and Danny yeah. are probably buddies. There you go. There you go. <laughs> cool. Uh, Alex, what have you been watching? I've been checking out The Midnight Gospel, also on Netflix. It's an animated show from Duncan Trussell. He's a, he's a comedian who's super into kind of like Buddhism and psychedelics and so as you can imagine, the show reflects that. It's basically, if you've seen Adventure Time or any of these kind of like adult, Adventure Time is actually for kids, but it's super psychedelic and weird animation style. Definitely meant to be watched in an altered state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. But this show is essentially like podcast interviews. Like it's Duncan Trussell just talking to people he wants to talk to with just insane animation like laid over the podcast interview. So it's definitely for a certain frame of mind probably for late at night on a certain substance. Uh, but it's it's really enjoyable. And, and the interviews go to some really profound places. Mm. And I think I heard that one of them, I haven't gotten to this yet, is like with his mom, who was like near the end of her life at the time of the like discussion. Mm. It starts out kind of like looking like a goofy stoner show, but can kind of go to these deep places really suddenly. If that sounds like your cup of tea, check it out. It's on Netflix, The Midnight Gospel. Nice. Awesome. Michael? I 
so I, I watched Mulan, which is why I said that, but I'm not going to talk about Mulan. Instead, <laughs> I'm going to talk about that I started Community, mm. which I had Whoa. never seen before. I, I, I think I saw like half of the pilot way back when, when it was on TV. And I was like, I don't know, this, this is, I don't like this. Uh, and so I went back and I, I've started it and I'm now like maybe halfway through the first season and I'm loving it and it is really enjoyable and, and fun. And it's very surreal seeing all these people in a yep. room together that I'm like, whoa, 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 yeah. wait, Allison Brie and Jillian Jacobs and Donald Glover and Chevy Chase were like, they knew each other yeah. and like were in rooms like on a frequent basis and like the Rousseau brothers like mm -hmm. directed it and produced like it, it's weird. Like I knew that intellectually, but like actually experiencing all these people hanging out before they were huge and all, and all these things is provides like an extra layer of fun on top of it. So, so that's all I've also been compared more than once i think in the comments uh -huh. to uh abed <laughs> danny pretty uh and i didn't quite know what that meant and now i do and i wear that as a badge of pride there you go <laughs> I, I like abed quite a bit cool well this has been our conversation on moonrise kingdom beyond the screenplay is produced by vince major our editor is eric schneider i've been joined today by the lessons from the screenplay team trisha rand brian bittner and alex Cayeros. i am michael tucker and you can find all of our twitter handles in the show notes feel free to reach out and say hi thank you to the patrons who support the show and make it possible thank you for listening and we'll see you in the next episode bye everybody i love you but you don't know what you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> bye <laughs>